Hi, it's Felix Marquez from Orlando Medical Institute. I'm here with two guests. Uh, you just probably heard the great lecture from Dr. Roca, uh, and I have uh, Dr. Yana Walker uh, from Osceola, our medical director here, and Dr. Roca from uh, Osceola Regional Medical Center. So, great presentation. Thank you yeah, for taking really the opportunity to uh, shine a little light on um, a little anatomy and physiology, especially the cardiovascular system. Um, so, we have some, I have some great questions that I have for you guys. Um, we talked about cardiac output, which we feel that's significant uh, to understand. So, uh, cardiac output you mentioned is uh, stroke volume times heart rate. Mm -hmm. uh, the stroke volume and the heart rate, does one play a greater role than the other? Is one more significant than the other to give my cardiac output? And what I'm referencing is if stroke volume decreased, can heart rate compensate? And then vice versa, if heart rate decreases, can stroke volume compensate to maintain a good cardiac output? Uh, so that's a very good question, and uh, you know, uh, it's well known that the cardiac output is a product of stroke volume and heart rate. So if you're talking about a healthy individual who is able to compensate for uh, his, uh, because the only way that the body can increase your cardiac output is either increase your heart rate or your stroke volume. In a healthy individual, if your stroke volume is low, then your heart will be able to compensate for that. However, in a heart that is not able to adequately compensate, no matter how much stroke volume you increase by giving these people fluid, you will have to increase the heart rate for the cardiac output to be high. So it'll be safe to say, always correct the heart rate if it's abnormal before we even think about giving fluids to correct stroke volume. Exactly, yeah. and a healthy individual, yeah. that, that would be the right approach. What kind of, what that brings to mind is the patient who has AFib. You know, I think about that patient who's hypotensive and very, very tachycardic, you'll get them sometimes. Um, often we will treat the heart rate first and then we anticipate that the blood pressure will come up. Uh, because if you think about it, the ventricles are contracting, you know, the atriums are contracting very fast and minimally, so you're not getting that stroke volume. So that's why you don't have that blood pressure that's high enough. Uh, so then if you can kind of slow the heart rate down and then get a better contraction, you get that blood flow and then now your heart, your um, blood pressure goes back up. Awesome. So that's why, uh, you know, instead of just fluids, fluids, fluids for those patients, you actually treat the rhythm and then you'll get that blood pressure back. So when you recognize the hypotension, look at all your factors that can make the patient right. hypotension, bu hypotensive before we start treatment. So right. if I have that patient, I took his blood pressure, he's hypotensive, and then I look, his, I look at the cardiac monitor, if they had him on, his heart rate says 40, confirm that, that the pulse rate's 40 or 30, and then treat that first, then move from there. Yeah, mm -hmm. same thing, like you said, with bradycardia. Uh, sometimes you have, you're hypotensive because your heart is not pumping fast enough. So if it's 30, it's 40, and you're hypotensive as well, obviously you want to look at what all the inciting factors may be, but sometimes just raising that blood pressure or raising that heart rate up, you know, with uh, atropine or a pacemaker, then that'll get the blood pressure that you need. So now we kind of going into the bradycardic. I always have a, a question that everybody asks me is like, Felix, atropine. Can we give atropine to a high degree block? Can a third degree or second degree die to get at should we give them atropine? Is it gonna reverse the effect or make them more bradycardic if I gave atropine to a third degree heart block? Yeah. So we do this oftentimes in the ER. I mean, a lot of this is practice. We try to do as much evidence-based medicine as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you just kind of have to throw the kitchen sink at people. But you want to know exactly what you're doing and why you're doing. So if you know what atropine does, then you should know that it should not affect third-degree blocks. So the question is, why are you giving it? Are you giving it until you have time to do something more definitive? Uh, are you giving it just because that's what your protocol says? Right. Like, what is the reason for that? So typically in third degree blocks, it does not affect it. So if you give it, there should not be any harm. But if you give it, you should not really expect anything to happen either. So if it did work, is it because the third degree is so high up in the bundle of his that it becomes effective? Or it just does, it doesn't work, period, and we shouldn't waste our time with atropine on those high degree blocks? Uh, it's very hard to, first of all, diagnose those and differentiate them between a type 2. I've seen certain type 2s that look like third degrees because they're dropping beats just, you know, coincidentally at the same time a third degree would look. So I still would give atropine, especially if it's something that you're not delaying any, you know, yeah, cutaneous case. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. If you're not delaying anything and you're like, I just need to give something right now, the patient is an extremist, I don't think there's a problem with that, especially because our diagnosing ability in the field is a bit tough.